I'll give the floor to the representative nominated by the Pacific region, Mr. Gasali Ohorella from Indonesia. Tabea upu elai, upu mata binani, kai muru makau bay holi nusa inei, tunai kai atet lebui, nunusaku saka ite pusumi mena muria. Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, Ambassadors, Heads of Delegations, my Indigenous Relations, ladies and gentlemen. I am a proud product of Maluku and a young descendant of the Alifuru people. It is with great privilege and humility that I stand here before you on this remarkable day on behalf of the Pacific Indigenous region to celebrate the anniversary with all of you, the anniversary of a normative shift, a major accomplishment that occurred 10 years ago in this hall before the eyes of the world. The United Nations chose to change its attitude and committed to no longer interact with the hostile flag of conquest vis-a-vis -vis indigenous peoples. It went from consideration to commitment and recommitment as the General Assembly adopted the World Conference Outcome Document in 2014. The commitment and recommitment that has been a long time coming did not occur without a sacrifice. I, we, will not be in this hall of power without those that showed unyielding determination and extraordinary work towards the development of the UN Declaration. Amongst others, Chief Foreign Alliance, whose words still resonate within me, Grand Chief Ed John, Grand Chief Wilton Littlechild, our Premier Forum member Les Malazer, Kenneth Deer, Professor James Anaya, and John Bernard Henriksen. And our Pacific champions, people from the likes of Victor Kashepo, Tracy Fare, Moana Jackson, Mililani Trask, Palpina Shaureka, Claire Charters, and many, many more across this beautiful planet. Had it not been for their tireless efforts in awakening our, consci our conscience of decolonization, demilitarization, and general leadership, we would not have the opportunity to be here today. We can never fully repay the sacrifices of those who dedicate their lives for our, for our rights. But today, and every day forward, we can honor their sacrifice, which we must. We must honor them by continuing our work and aspire to follow the example they have set. And that is partly the reason why I stand here today, to celebrate with you all the fruits of their work. Much appreciation goes to the UN treaty bodies that rely on the Declaration to interpret Indigenous people's human rights and related national obligations, and to recognize those states that have joined the consensus. However, we continue to face problems. We see an increasing lack of political will, lack of knowledge of the Declaration, and lack of adequate interpretation of Indigenous people's rights. And actions vary between progressive leg legislation to abuses. Many indigenous peoples in the Pacific are not only on the front lines of climate change, like in Tuvalu, entrenched to protect our ancestral lands, territories, and resources, and waters, like in Maluku and West Papua. We, all, we are also disproportionately subject to the criminal justice systems, like in Australia and New Zealand, and facing extreme poverty, increased suicide, and deteriorating health across the region. The numerous interventions that were delivered the past decade is a statement to that including Mr. Urban's August, from whom we spoke yesterday at the Permanent Forum on behalf of Project Access Capacity Training Workshop, emphasizing the need for both states and Indian peoples to move from rhetoric to action. We share that point of view. The, consist the consistent song of the past 10 years is the use of domestic law or national legislation as a way of circumventing international human rights obligations. Therefore, I take this opportunity to remind the international community that it is required to interpret the UN Declaration according to the nature of human rights. 
the, provision, the provisions all assert to be exercised by virtue of self-determination self in a fashion consistent with international law. Therefore, this consistency overrules inconsistent legislation on the domestic level. The provisions are interrelated, universal, interconnected, indivisible, and inter interdependent, and implementation is the priority. Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, Heads of Delegations, Indigenous Relations, ladies and gentlemen, the existing and vibrant energy of the Indigenous Movement is ignited every time we engage with the United Nations to work towards achieving the ends of the Declaration, whether it is in Geneva, Paris, Bonn, Germany, or right here in New York City. Today, we have the unique opportunity and privilege to summon and reaffirm the positive energy written within the text of each letter in the, in the Declaration. Now is the time. This is our time. This is a time where we continue to carry our work together. This is a time where we shall overcome challenges. We will continue to do what's hard and achieve what is great for a better future. This is a time where we widen the circle of opportunity and deepen the meaning of our rights. Because the Declaration is more than the minimum standard. It is a map in the stars where we can realize the dreams of our ancestors. So I look to our future elders. Persist in realizing your ancestors' dreams and your dreams. Breathe, li breathe life into the UN Declaration. Keep greeting life with kia ora. Hold on to your aina for the next generations. Continue your national aspirations with Menamuria. Keep throat singing in Russia. Keep wearing your gakti in, Sa in Sapmi. Keep playing the pife in Brazil. And keep the round dance going, my North American family. At times it can be difficult, but in the end, hope, dignity, and justice will prevail. Because people ultimately stand up for principles, values, and a love for Mother Earth. Matebulu, Ami Alifura Nai, Bai Moluku, thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the Pacific region.